this one. Okay, All right. here we go. Hello and welcome to Why Collaborative Enterprises Need a Better Way to Manage Risk. My name is Jen Schmitz and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'd like to now introduce you to our speakers, Rob Junker, the T Chief Technology Officer at Code42, and Mark Wataziak, Code42's Vice President of Portfolio Strategy and Product Marketing. These two are absolutely up for questions, so please don't hold back. Go ahead and put them in the question box and we'll get to them at the end as many as we can. I know our speakers today are ready to have a lot of fun, so let's go ahead and get started. But first, guys, what's up with the shirts? <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, I got my, I gotta say, I got my hopes up during the keynote um, when Joe and Michael were talking about t-shirt tuxedos. I guess Rob and I were the only suckers that followed through with thematic t-shirts. Um, so as Jen said, we're, we both like to talk a lot, <clears throat> and uh, but we're going to keep this session relatively unfiltered, somewhat um, unscripted, and completely untethered, meaning we're not doing any PowerPoint slides. Which so I'm actually just... super excited about in the Zoom era of not having PowerPoints as we go through this. So, yeah, and I'm sure I'm... now there's no PowerPoints. Half the attendees probably went to another session as well, Mark. So but you, well, you have a <laughs> you have a tendency to wheel out the whiteboard. So let's not so be once... surprised. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, on exactly. deck. Once you start riffing, that thing usually comes out, and you start drawing pictures that no one can really understand. But anyway. Um, Back to the shirts, um, we're gonna have a discussion. So in this scenario, fittingly so, I'm gonna be the problem, collaboration. And fittingly so, Rob is gonna play the role of the solution, security. Now we're not gonna do a skit or anything like that, so don't worry, this isn't gonna be um, that cheesy. Jen's gonna try to keep us on pace and on topic, um, on time, so good luck with that, Jen. Yeah, good um, luck, Jen, that's a task. <laughs> so. Um, I could stay, I, you know, I could just start rattling off. We have this question, the question, like the session is titled, you know, uh, there's pieces of the session about like why collaboration, why collaboration technology, why collaboration cultures, and what are the risks that are associated with that culture? And I can give you just a ton of stats. I mean, I could just, I could just lay them all out on the table about all these stats about adoption of collaboration technology, but I'm not going to do that because the why the reason why we have collaboration, the reason why I exist, this problem, um, is one word, it's speed. I, it's, it's, if you had to sum it up in one word, it's speed. And I was interesting, I was reading an article this morning uh, in Fortune, where they were interviewing the Accenture CEO, Julie Sweet. Um, and, and Julie talked about the effects the pandemic has had on, on Accenture. Now Accenture had like a, a 10 year plan to move to cloud. Um, and, and, she, and she talked about how the pandemic and this era of digital, tra basically their digital transformation strategy was, was a 10 year horizon. It just got cut in half. It's down to five years, right? It's about speed. It's about um, moving fast. Joe talked about this in the, in the keynote around how digital transformation is, is, is speeding up business and CEOs wanna drive speed and collaboration is a big part of that. So when you think about it, you know, if you go back to root cause and you think about the, the reason why we have collaboration, um, everything worth measuring is rooted in time, everything. You think about any measurable impactful business metric uh, that we associate with time to market, time to revenue, time to profitability, shareholder return, um, time to value for the customer. Everything's rooted in time. Security is no different. Think about all the metrics that we hold ourselves accountable to. Time to detect, time to triage, assess, investigate, um, remediate, respond, recover. Everything's rooted in time. And and in the, uh, in the very collaboration, um, the, the very time essence metric that we're trying to allude to, this is why the CEO and the CIO and even the HR leaders have built this culture, this built this culture of speed, this culture of collaboration. And as a security industry, it's not a choice of whether we choose to keep pace, we need to keep pace. And that in lies the problem. So I want to I don't want to dive too deep into that. And I want to set Rob up, um, you know, in my unfiltered, unscripted way with no PowerPoint uh, support system um, below me. 
um, with an analogy, right? So I think when we paint the picture of the problem, um, and I had an epiphany, right? I was, this, this came to me um, this weekend because uh, my favorite time of year, the NFL season started. Um, and I'm sitting on my couch watching the, and Rob, you got to follow me on this. If you, if you're not an NFL <laughs> fan, Rob, this is going to, we're going to be doing a lot of dancing because you don't get this. And I, I'm pretty confident you are, and you'll get this analogy, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you this in the context of the national football league and see if you, if you can put it in the context of how you solve this problem. Sound fair? Very fair. Let's do it. All right. So bear with me here. I'm going to give you some context. I'm, I'm sitting on my couch. I'm watching the, uh, the Packers completely dismantle the Vikings. You're going to uh, start there. Yeah, really? exactly. okay. <laughs> I'm a Bears fan. So it's, it's, it was, well, Detroit practically dismantled us till the fourth quarter. Anyway, so I'm flipping between the Viking game and the uh, NFL red zone. You know, that channel that jumps from game to game, Very well. um, fantasy managers, dream channel. Um, and one thing I noticed, no matter what game it was on, no matter what game they were showing, there was absolutely no noise. It's like zero crowd noise, you know, and you could hear everything. You could hear, you know, the call at the line. You could hear every hit. You could hear every tackle, um, every swear word. Um, you could hear every whistle. Um, it was super clear. And no matter how fast the red zone jumped from game to game, I was able to keep pace. I was able to keep pace because there wasn't any, any distractions, if you will. Um, so I'm watching Red Zone, and naturally, um, I'm thinking about work. Because what do you do when you watch football? You start thinking about security, right? Security, 24-7 job, right? Seven days a week. So naturally, I start thinking about security, specifically this session. Um, and this whole collaboration culture and speed, and, and then I have this epiphany. The culture, and follow me on this one, Rob, the culture we live in today, the game we're playing, this collaboration game, is just like the NFL. The speed of collaboration by design is getting faster and faster. The, the, the NFL game is getting by design faster and faster. The only difference is in collaboration, it's getting noisier and noisier. Now the NFL put in this 70 decibel restriction on stadium noise. So they're trying to control their noise a bit, level the playing field, if you will. But in our world, there is no decibel limit. The noise, it's getting noisier and noisier. So Rob, your challenge number one, before I toss this over to you, is collaboration, me as the problem, um, and insider risks that come with it is a very noisy problem. So pocket that one first. Right. You got crowd noise. You got like, unstoppable crowd noise and it's only growing. So my next thought process complete travels to the to the rev to the referees. And I think about the referees and their ability to keep pace with this speed of play. Right. Think about it. They're taking in information all the time. Are you tracking me on this, Rob? They're taking oh, yeah. in how many players are on the field. Game clock, play clock, you know. Is the offensive line moving? Is the defensive line going to jump off sides? They're looking at the setup of the defense. Now, granted, there's four or five of them on the field, but they're all taking in this information. The second the ball is snapped, they're taking in more information. Is it a running play or a passing play? Because the penalties will be different. Well, and not to mention, even in, even in that environment, the, 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 it, it, whether you call a penalty or not is going to be different. You know, how severe is holding? Holding happens all the time, right? Exactly, exactly. So they're taking in this information in real time and they're making split second judgment calls on whether they're gonna throw the flag, on whether they're gonna blow the whistle and stop play. They have this innate ability to take in all of this activity in real time and make a call, right? So here's your second challenge, Rob, relative to that. If you think about the way security technology is designed today, it's literally, or if you think about security technology through the, through the lens of dealing with, my, with me, the problem, right? It's literally throwing flags on every single play, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes the two, we, I mean, we call them alerts, right? They'd be hundreds of alerts, thousands of alerts a day. Imagine if we actually blew the whistle and stopped play on every single alert. Imagine if we blocked 
every single flag that was thrown or enforced action on every single flag that was thrown. The speed of play would come to a screeching halt. Collaboration would come to a screeching halt. Productivity would be frozen. Um, so naturally we don't. We don't even blow the whistle. We don't stop play. We don't enforce action. And when we do that, what we're seeing, data is exposed. It's exfiltrated, it's stolen, it's, it's lost, it's leaked, it's what have you, right out from underneath us, right? So the fact that, you know, we would contend the fact that security technology is having a hard time keeping up with the pace of collaboration, it's having a hard time keeping up with the pace of play, like the, the play, pace of play in terms of the collaboration and what we're dealing with. So here's your next challenge, Rob. So I, the first challenge I gave you was noise, right? We're noisy. I'm a noisy problem, right? Mm -hmm. Second thing is um, how do you know, how are you going to, how are you going to ingest all this data and understand and make a, make a call, right? How are you going to make a call and know when data is, is leaking or exposed or what have you? The third is in your next challenge, how do you discern between what is collaboration and what is an insider threat? How do you do that in real time? So the security analyst has no idea. So when you think about this, with all these alerts coming, the security analyst has no idea what is an, a threat, when to step, when to blow to whistle, when to when to stop play, and when not to. How can you blame them? Right? I asked. I sat down with with a bunch of analysts and just talked to them. I said, "How do you know you're getting hundreds? Of, you're getting thousands, if not hundreds, of alerts a day? In, what do they say? Intuition. I just go with gut feel, right?" Um, and uh, who can blame them, right? This is the root, I would argue, this is the root of this pervasive problem we call insider risk. And I firmly believe that me, collaboration, I'm running rampant, I'm causing this insider risk problem and it's running rampant in organizations, especially organizations rooted in speed. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and in this era, almost every organization is rooted in speed, okay? You tracking so far, Rob? I am. I am. I'm liking the analogy, actually. It plays okay. really well. So here's where it gets interesting, right? In the infinite wisdom, this is, this is all. Now, granted, I didn't think about all of this on the couch on Sunday. It, I, it was building over a few days as I was, you know, letting it, you know, percolate. So then I start to think about, okay, you got Joe talked about this early, earlier this morning. You got the CEO says, we got to move faster. Right. We need a culture that moves fast. We got to digitally transform, improve our customer experience, improve time to market, time to value, time to revenue, et cetera, et cetera. CIO put in a culture or technology that helps us do that. CIO says, I'm on it, puts in collaboration technology, puts in all cloud technology, all sorts of things. HR leader comes on board also in involved in that culture building process, right? But do they pause to think, so they're built, they've built this game, right? They've built the pace of like football. They've, they've increased the pace of play, the speed of the game mm -hmm. on purpose, right? Intentionally. But they didn't pause to think about who's going to referee this game, right? If we're going to move that we, you know, and referees are here for a reason, right? So I would contend in the collaboration world, that the insider threat analyst, the security analyst, is the referee of the collaboration culture. Think about, the, think about that. They're the ones taking in all the information in real time. Mm -hmm. They're the ones making judgment calls based on the information they get. They're making the calls whether to throw the flag or not, to stop play or not, blow the whistle, enforce action, et cetera, et cetera. In the NFL, now think about this. In the NFL, referees exist for two primary reasons to protect the integrity of the game and the safety of the players. An insider threat analyst, when you think about it, has the, shares those same two objectives. The insider threat analyst is there to protect the integrity of the culture, the brand, and the safety of the data, the employee, the customer, the partner, et cetera. Tracking? I am tracking. Yep. Now, <clears throat> when you think about it, the challenge we face now is how do we do that? 
how, given the noise levels, given this dis discerning between insider threat and collaboration, et cetera, et cetera, how do you do that? Is it AI? Is it ML? Maybe, someday. Well, we don't have someday. Like this is a problem now and it's running rampant. So what are we as a security industry gonna do to address this problem? So I don't have the answers. I'm really good at like pointing the finger at the problem, like pointing the finger at myself. Like I'm your problem, Rob. Um, I'm turning to the technologist to, to uh, when it comes to solving it, I'm going to, I'm going to place my bet on, on you, the technologist. So, um, well, well, I appreciate that. Not just a technologist, by the way, a security technologist, right? Which means really two big things, which was first, I grew up a hacker and in third grade, I probably should have called prison and made reservations, but lovely, but luckily never got caught. And then second of all, one of my greatest superpowers is actually not just in defending data, but also consuming coffee, right? So as you talk about collaboration, you started off Mark by saying, you know, I am your problem, right? And I wanna start off by telling everybody like collaboration poses a problem for security, but it's also the greatest opportunity that we have right now, right? The ways in which these tools allow our cultures to collaborate, to speed up the pace of the game, like you were talking about, the way in which we can bring more people into both active and passive problems. The reality is, is that collaboration represents such a big opportunity for me that the security side of me has to figure out how to make collaboration be my best asset as opposed to my worst enemy um, as we talk about playing that game of football on the field, right? Now, I'm gonna make an assumption that everyone's listening today has already accepted the fact that cloud is reality. We did that a little while ago and I know a lot of us were squeamish when cloud first came out, um, but now more than ever, we're seeing cloud make it into every one of the organizations that we, we interface with and in fact, um, just to share with you, I was actually talking to a CISO about a week ago, and during the um, product integration conversation we were having with Insider, they mentioned that they wanted to, us to connect to Google Drive, Box, and Microsoft uh, Office 365, right? And it kind of blew my mind, right, when I was thinking about OneDrive, Box, and Drive all coming together because this organization had embraced so many collaboration technologies that there were so many vectors that they were exposed to. Um, yet at the same time, they were so excited to have all those different technologies for different purposes. So let's make the assumption for today's purposes that collaboration's there because you're right, one thing that collaboration does do is it forces the pace of the game to speed up. Things are happening faster, plays are happening faster, plays are, are you know, going further with the productivity that's increasing, um, all of that comes together. Now let's start off by talking about the how, right? The pace of play. Um, and I'm gonna start off by saying that there actually is a right pace of play in a game. Your analogy, Mark, when you were going through it and talking about you know, the plays that are being run, right? Um, marching down the field takes huddles, right? It takes referees to reset the field. It takes moments of reflection on previous plays to make decisions about where the next play goes. And to that end, there's this balance of the pace of play, but undoubtedly that pace of play, the right pace of play in anyone's business is to be as fast as possible without jeopardizing the integrity of the game, right? So let's talk about how to actually do that. And let's talk about to detect, you know, what is the right pace of play and how do we actually pay attention to being able to do that? Because what's so important now is that there's been so many transitions in our, in our workplace that it goes way further than just the basic technologies that we used to look for exfiltration detection, right? Gone are the days where someone, you know, thinks about detection logic and says, someone stuck a USB hard drive into their machine, copied files off and clearly took it somewhere, right? It's gone way beyond that. Nowadays, especially with all of the technologies we have that are collaboration fueled in and of themselves, almost every user's got personal drop boxes or personal box accounts or personal G drive accounts, or um, for that matter, um, engineers have repos that are in GitHub um, that are accessible either personally or professionally for that matter, right? We've actually here at Code42 have seen more exfiltration now start to come up with even more creative vectors, things like AirDrop, printers, right? I mentioned that, I didn't even know printers still existed. Turns out that they do though, right? Um, but it's a great way to take data that you can print off and just walk away with and bring to the next uh, whatever job that you might have next or um, give to you know nefarious people that are involved in the process, right? 
And then finally, you have these cloud providers. And I think the cloud collaboration providers that today that Mark, you are my problem, right? You also, because of the sharing technologies and the way in which we can copy data so easily to a cloud and exfiltrate it. And the fact that every so often, if I send you a large file via email, you know, those cloud collaboration providers are so friendly. They say, hey, this is a really big file. Do you really want to send it to Mark in email? I can <laughs> happily send him just a link if you want. Um, and what they don't share is that that link's a publicly accessible link. And in many cases, those providers providers will be so nice that they'll come back around and even full text index it for you so that anyone can find it later, right? So there's so many different ways and I think that that amplifies the problem because those signals that we're looking for today, like you said, it's a noisy problem to solve because there's so many avenues by which people can accidentally be an insider risk um, that we have to pay attention to every one of those signals that are out there. Now, beyond that, a big power comes in the simplicity though, right? If you create that much signal, now you've got to get that signal down to a noise ratio where you're really amplifying the things that matter most, right? It's not the hold where someone just briefly grabbed the player and just pushed away from them. You're looking for the hold where they drag that player down to the ground and bury their face in the, in the turf, right? Comes out with the piece too. And around that too, I mean, that's where the simplicity comes in because simplicity is not just about detecting an exfiltration event. It's actually taking that exfiltration event and decorating it with content that brings to life the context of that exfiltration event, right? So if you're paying attention to just the exfiltration event itself, that's one thing. But if you start paying attention to the file that's being exfiltrated and understanding, is it a risky file? Is it source code, you know, versus an image, you know, things along those lines really begin to come into play. And then finally, you've got to take into account the user context, right? Understanding, is this a high risk employee? Is this a departing employee? Is this an employee who I like to call a frequent flyer who constantly is making poor security hygiene decisions that put more data at risk, right? And if you crash those three things together, all of a sudden you can take what might be a little bit of signal and amplify that to know exactly where your risks are when they're happening and know that when that whistle needs to blow because of something being egregious associated with it, right? And especially as we think about kind of departing employees and Joe mentioned in the keynote that 63% of users take data when leaving an organization, that's a great example. If I see a departing employee who's exfiltrating data, it's obviously at a higher risk, if you will, than one of my regular employees. Now, the last thing I want to mention in terms of those key signals to maintain that pace of play to go as fast as you can without jeopardizing the integrity of the game comes on speed. And speed means whatever tools you choose have to integrate into your existing ecosystem so that you're able to make decisions fast and it's not a secondary process that you might need to run. Um, tools like, for example, some of our partners today on the identity side with Duo, being able to automatically provision users and understand escalated privileges, or for that matter, backends and response tools like Sims and Soars. And again, some great partners of ours today in terms of Palo Alto, Exabeam, Splunk, Sumo Logic, Rapid7, all fit into those equations. But the beauty of it is you can solve the pace of play, the insider risk problem, without having to expand your ecosystem with a new set of processes, a new workflow, yeah. and tie it all together so you can respond just that fast, right? So you take all of that in terms of how, what are we looking at? How are we getting signal? How do we make sure that the speed of response is there? And then we talk about the what, right? And what I mean by this is now that the, we understand the pace of play and what the, the speed of the game is at, I agree with you 100%. The security analyst is the one who is sitting there and now gets to make the decision whether or not to throw the flag, right? And this comes through a lot of the things that we just talked about above, right? In terms of the signal, the simplicity and speed. Um, but it's the combinations of them that really matter. So like I gave the example before of a holding penalty that's minor versus one that's, that's huge. Imagine in your organization, if you were able to say, hey, Rob Junker is an engineer and he just sent a personal email to himself containing our corporate source code, right? That's a big red flag, right? That's a penalty where someone's grabbing the, the flag right out of their pocket and throwing it right into the center of the field and probably more than one ref is actually gonna be the one who's throwing that flag, right? It's not a judgment call. That's something that that's critical, right? But at the same time, there's other cases where maybe I shared a file with someone and I didn't necessarily realize I was sending them a public link. Under those circumstances, I become a lot more of that accidental insider. And in those scenarios, it makes more sense for us to remind the user, hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing that and correct their behavior before it becomes something that becomes a habit of theirs, right? Mm -hmm. um, making sure that we get them under control. 
Now that risk recognition, when to throw the flag or not, right, with the signal is one side of it. Then you run into the risk prioritization too, which I don't want to also, uh, you know, say that our, our, we know every person who's listening today, um, their security operation centers are filled with priorities, right? Um, they don't have the time to respond to every little thing that's happening in their organization. So not only do we have to say, hey, this is a bad risk, right? There's also the other side of it too, which is this is a really bad risk, right? This is this is a stop the play, blow the whistle, the play is dead, right? Because there's something wrong about the technology or a formation, if you will, that, that, that comes out um, early on in play, right? And I think that's the beauty of this is that that a lot of the, the stuff that we're doing right now really allows you to prioritize those signals, know which ones need to be acted upon first, and don't just generate events, and they don't just generate alerts, but with the right tools in play, you can automatically bring it up to almost an incident-worthy event where yeah. someone needs to take an instant action um, to be able to stop the play before it gets out of hand. Yeah, the I last think about that, Rob. I mean, that's a great point. I'm, and I'm, I'm playing off of your simplicity um, and your risk prioritization element. It's like, when do they blow a play dead or why do they blow a play dead? Uh, if you're a referee in the NFL, going back to that analogy, um, it's really to protect the safety of the players. Like this play cannot continue That's because right. the safety of the player is in jeopardy, right? So similar in an insider threat, there are those risks that need to be prioritized that say, hey, we got to stop play because right. this is a risk to our players, our employees, our customers, our partners, our data, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm totally tracking you on that. Yeah, and, and the beauty of it is that, especially as you talk about blowing that whistle um, and blowing the play dead, you bring it back to the integrity of the game, the safety of the players, but it's also about the, the speed at which the refs blow the play dead too, right? And it's about the speed by which those penalties are assessed. And I think the, the other side of it too, just as we talk about any successful insider threat program, it's not just about throwing the flag. The refs also make a determination. Is this a five-yard penalty? Is this a 15-yard penalty? Is this an ejection from the game? And to be honest with you, those actually mirror the responses that we typically see in a successful insider threat program, right? A five-yard penalty is one of those where it's like, hey, you didn't do something right. Please make sure you watch your behavior going forward, right? The 15-yard penalty is typically something where someone takes a response out of, the, of, of, out of an exfiltration event, and they penalize that user, or in some cases, the team that that user might be on for choosing risky behavior or do something so bad that it requires them to... Um, you know, essentially uh, take a, a take a step towards a, a, a corrective behavior, um, whether that be actually a formal corrective behavior or um, something that's more loose, but it, it requires a corrective behavior at that point. And then, of course, you run into the ejection of the game, which at the end of this is essentially, thanks for playing, um, you know, you're out of the game at that yeah. point. Yeah. But as you bring it together, the analogy you brought up today, Mark, was just fantastic in terms of tying this all together. Um, and I love the notion of the red zone because I think that's the way that we all operate in security, right? Um, that we're constantly in the red zone. And winning the game means being able to work the fastest you can at your pace of play while still moving the ball down the field without, to your point, jeopardizing the integrity of the game and the safety of the players that come together. And that's what it's all about. So I'm going to go ahead and blow the whistle on you guys. Um, <laughs> that was <laughs> fabulous. We have just a couple minutes for a few quick questions. So I wanted to try to get a couple in. Thank you so much for taking us through that. I think that was great. It's a good way to keep it in mind. You know, having that analogy really helps. Um, so one we got was the collaboration culture, you know, always evolving. And this person would like to know what insider risk do you see looming ahead? Ooh, um, I can take that one, Rob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think about the the human side, I mean, the human side of it, the human side of the problem, right? And and kind of what we're dealing with today. I think there's a lot of um, what I often think about is 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 the amount of uncertainty there is right now in the market um, with people, what have you, um, given the current climate. I mean, employees are dealing with a ton of uncertainty. Right. And when you have a, a uncertainty, people are just, just, just to call them employees, just call them their, their people. We're all dealing with a certain level of uncertainty, anxiety, stress, if you will. And when we're faced with anxiety, stress and uncertainty, we start to make poor decisions. Now, there are nefarious people out there that take advantage or are taking advantage of this uncertainty, of this stress, of this anxiety 
and you know we we've talked about them in the book as insiders for hire right um, offering money to employees who have access to information to get that information. They know collaboration cultures exist. They know data can flow to and from anywhere and that a lot of people have access to it. So I think about that as a, as a looming and actually growing problem um, uh, in, in this world, right, of, of collaboration and speed and, and insider risk. Perfect. I have one more that we have time for, just a quick answer. So one person did say, like, everything sounds great, the analogy makes sense, but we all know, like you said, this is a really noisy space. So do you have suggestions on, you know, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you work on to control the noise? Yeah, and, and maybe Mark, if you're okay with it, let me take a stab at this one, because when I talk to CISOs here at Code42, and we talk about controlling the noise, um, we talk about three T's to kind of get things started, if you will, down a, an insider risk um, uh, program, if you will, right? Um, the first one starts with technology, and that technology has to be very, very good at not obstructing your users in any way, allowing them to do what it is that they need to do, but at the same time, um, making sure that you're aware of what that signal looks like, right? It, it, and, and that signal is going to be changing, right? So the right product, you know, candidly doesn't have policies because policies change, technology changes, right? The, the right product is going to be sitting there adjusting to new threat vectors and being able to amplify the signal that matters most to you and your organization, um, as opposed to every exfiltration event that's going to happen because that's just too many for you to, to, to deal with, right? So the right technology will be able to be dropped in, control maybe to the, the football analogy, that crowd noise. Um, that's happening within the stadium itself, right? Um, I'm trying to bring it all back, Mark, just so you know. So that, that first T in technology is key. Um, the second one is transparency, right? And I think what's really amazing about transparency and something to tell you a little bit about myself at Code42, I actually email the insider team here at Code42 before I do something um, that is going to flag by my product, right? It becomes a deterrent because of the transparency that we have about the way in which we're looking at information that's moving around, right? We want to be open with our employees, if you will, to be able to tell them that this is the kind of things we're looking for. And again, you shouldn't be doing it to begin with, but at the same time, just so you know, we're sitting here, but we're here to make sure that you and our data are safe, right? Um, it's not in any way where it's big brother, right? It's, it really is just something, if you will, um, having a referee there and assuming you play with integrity in the game, there's no risk of you having a penalty thrown, right? Um, and that's the power of, of the right um, kind of transparency and technology uh, being put together. The last one, which I wanna bring up, which is also critical, is training. The, the third T, as we talk about the technology, transparency and training is the, is the training aspect, right? Um, the goal here is to make sure users understand the way they should be acting, the way they should be reacting, um, and at the same time, they wish the way they, the safe ways in which they should be collaborating. Uh, this is making sure that people understand why risks are important to be mitigated, and also why their behavior can put the organization at risk as too. Um, so the three of those things: transparency, if you will, is a deterrent, but also make sure people realize that you know there's a lot going on. Training, make sure that you don't get more signal, more noise than you need, because users know how they should be behaving. And the technology is the thing that at the end of this is paying attention to everything to make sure that you have that signal um, that's coming out of it. And that's together, if you will, how you can control that noise. Nailed it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I solve problems. That's what I do. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much. That was fabulous. And thank you to all the attendees. Um, this will be available via recording after this um, in just, I think, a couple hours. So look for that if you want to go back and re-listen to anything or send us any additional questions. So thank you both. Mark, it's always a pleasure doing a session with you. And Jen, thanks again for moderating as well. Thank you both. This was Anytime. a lot. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.